Hello everyone. I, I'm Lalit Basin, a practicing lawyer in New Delhi, India. I also happen to be the president of the Bar Association of India and president of the Society of Indian Law Firms, besides being the chairperson of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the India branch. Um, I welcome you to this global legal confex, which has been uh, organized. Uh, I think the topics are very, very relevant. The topic assigned to me today is one of the most uh, controversial topics during the last uh, nearly three decades. Uh, this uh, question has faced the Indian legal profession as also the regulatory body and the government of India. And that relates to what we call the entry of foreign lawyers or foreign law firms into India. Uh, this debate has been going on. Uh, it coincided with the liberalization of Indian economy in early 90s. At that time, possibly, a need was felt by the foreign law firms to set up some sort of a base in India. And to achieve that, they started to make their presence felt in India. And about three, four top international law firms sought the permission from the Reserve Bank of India to set up what they called the liaison offices, which were set up in Bombay. Now, as it happened that these liaison officers became fully full practice uh, legal activity, and someone challenged this in the Bombay High Court, that is the known as the famous case of Lawyers Collective. This was challenged in Bombay High Court, and in, 19, in 1997-98, but the judgment came in the year 2009, wherein the Bombay High Court held that it is not permissible for foreign law firms to practice in India. And what these four big law firms were doing in India was oh, contrary to the license given to them by the Reserve Bank of India only to set up liaison offices. Therefore, the Reserve Bank of India was directed to cancel, you see, the licenses and that is where the matter stood. Meanwhile, there was another writ petition filed in the Madras High Court that is known as the Balaji UC case, where the Madras High Court reviewed the judgment of Bombay High Court, con concurred with it, confirmed it that foreign law firms, they do not have any right, you see, to practice in India, and that matter was taken up, you see, to the Supreme Court by the Bar Council of India because the Madras High Court had given the liberty to the foreign law firms to have limited access, that is, fly in, fly out uh, for the foreign law firms to come and do some advisory consultation work in India. And the Madras High Court also allowed participation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in arbitration proceedings. This is what was challenged, you see, by the uh, Bar Council of India. And eventually in 2018, the Supreme Court of India decided, while affirming the decisions of the Bombay High Court and Madras High Court substantially, it held that foreign law firms, foreign lawyers cannot practice law in India. And the reasoning essentially was based on the fact that under the Advocates Act, uh, which, uh, which regulates the legal profession in India, the only Indian citizens have a right to practice law. And the Supreme Court clarified that practice of law does not merely mean litigation work. It also includes 
they corporate transactional work opinion work advisory work so that is also practice of law so there was like a complete prohibition for foreign lawyers to practice law in india although the supreme court did give this much liberty to the foreign lawyers which was given by the madras high court that on fly in fly out basis foreign lawyers could come and on ad hoc basis they could advise either their clients or some clients in india now this has been uh, the position since 2018 it is felt you see at 2018 19 that that was the right time for foreign lawyers to come to india because the indian legal profession had in the meanwhile galvanized itself and was ready to meet the competition and challenge from foreign lawyers and law firms therefore the society of indian law firms also the bar association of india conveyed to the government of india that they are ready to face you see the healthy competition which will be given to them by the foreign law firms therefore they have no objection at all if uh, a regulatory mechanism is set in place and foreign law firms are allowed to practice in india and but the position the problem as it emerges is the amendment of the advocates act now until and unless the act is amended to allow foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in some form or the other to practice law in india it cannot be implemented by the regulatory body or by the government therefore the requirement is that the law has to be amended and that is the function of the ministry of law and justice and the parliament you see the parliament of india to make this amendment now obviously during this time of covid crisis this is not the priority either for the government or for the legal profession i think because even the foreign law firms may not be at this point of time and i think for an another year or so would they would not be interested in expanding their activities because at the moment the requirement is to uh, strengthen themselves to to meet this uh, onslaught because that has that is bound to result in uh, reduction of work reduction of uh, the uh, revenue generation for the law firms so this may not be the right time but if covid had not happened then the situation is that possibly by amendment of the advocates act by the parliament it could have been possible for the government and the bar council of india to permit the foreign law firms to set up their offices of course under certain conditions like reciprocity and recognition of each others law degrees and all this that that is the function of the regulator therefore although the time is time was good but covid has intervened so i think for the time being and when my view possibly for another couple of years this may not happen and as and when it happens it will be a very good thing you see for the indian legal profession for the indian economy that they could um, they could face the healthy competition what i call uh, cooperation that is cooperation and competition combined with the india with the foreign law firms it would help in honing the skills both for indian lawyers as well as for foreign lawyers because indian law firms are presently second to none and they can also impart sufficient knowledge both in terms of intellectual inputs as well as in terms of even technology because artificial intelligence and other things is uh, 
taking place in India in a big way. And I see a bright future for the Indian legal profession and the international legal profession as and when the, um, it is opened up, the legal market is opened up in India. I think everyone can prosper amicably and uh, fruitfully. And these are my views on these uh, two bullet points which have been assigned to me. That is the current scenario of foreign law firms and foreign law firms in India, why it isn't a bad thing. I reiterate, it's a good thing as and when it happens. And the Indian legal profession is not opposed to the entry of foreign lawyers. And this has been conveyed emphatically to the government of India and the regulatory body that is the Bar Council of India. So these are my views. And now I hand over for further proceedings and presentation on the other points to Mr. Amar Kumar Sundaram, a very eminent head of the legal uh, corporate governance of the Royal Bank of Scotland, India. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Amar. I am the uh, head of uh, legal governance and regulatory affairs with the Royal Bank of India uh, in India. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland uh, has its subsidiary in India, and I'm the India head uh, for legal uh, governance and regulatory affairs. Uh, before we start, I must congratulate and uh, place my gratitude and thanks to the organization. Uh, the organization organizers have taken great effort in organizing this. Uh, they had an option of canceling it because of the pandemic issue, uh, but kudos to the organizer that they chose not to cancel it and uh, go ahead. Uh, and this also demonstrates uh, the importance of technology uh, and how technology has uh, made life easier and has come to our rescue, uh, even in a situation as tight as uh, pandemic, COVID, lockdown situations. So uh, thank you everybody for listening to us. And uh, we come back, come to a very, very important topic which has uh, been hotly debated among uh, legal professionals and legal communities all across the globe uh, and particularly in India, which is should India open legal market to international law firms. And uh, uh, before uh, I go uh, any further, I was going through the uh, website of Bar Council of India and uh, there was a vision statement uh, which was put uh, on the Bar Council of India website. And I would like to read a few lines from that. And it says that Indian legal profession cannot itself work in isolation from international practices and approaches in law. In a globalized world, the practice of law is increasingly becoming symbiotic with international changes and influences. And this uh, website also gives us small numbers which are very relevant for today's discussion and it says that there are 12 lakhs of uh, advocates who are registered there are 950 law schools in India 4 to 5 lakh law students across India 60 to 70 thousand law graduates joins the profession every year so that's the level uh, we are talking about it's, and these are all numbers which are on the websites there could be few more uh, but that that will set the tone of what kind of broader issues we are talking about uh, why entry of foreign law firms in india is going to be advantageous uh, how it can really help the young law graduates in india uh, before i go into uh, some of these issues the background why this became a very contentious issue was uh, was uh, the Supreme Court judgment in AK Balaji, which happened in March 2018. Uh, and the judgment said a couple of things. And uh, two important things that it said was uh, that practice of law in India uh, uh, includes both litigation and non-litigation practices. So uh, litigation as well as non-litigation. Uh, matters both constitute 
practice of law and practice of law as defined under the uh, Advocates Act. And then it also uh, reiterated what is stipulated under the Advocates Act. And it says that it is only advocates who are enrolled with the Bar Council of India, they are entitled to practice law. So practically it means that foreign lawyers cannot practice law which would mean that foreign lawyers cannot practice litigation and non-litigation matters. Now, this opened up a lot of issues which were, uh, which are very, very contentious. So uh, there, is, there is an ambiguity as to what constitute practice of law, uh, whether drafting constitute a practice of law, whether uh, 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 giving an opinion on an issue uh, which has legal dimension, whether that constitute a practice of law. Uh, there are many subject matter experts who provide uh, expertise and their views on a matter which will border legal interpretation, whether that constitute practice of law. Uh, so these are ambiguity which is still there in the judgment. Also uh, brought into fore the regulatory regime so there was a discussion uh, whether these foreign law firms, if they are allowed to set up offices in India, uh, who will regulate these foreign lawyers? Will Bar Council of India regulate them? And if they have to regulate, uh, whether they are required to be registered with the Bar Council of India? Uh, there was, there is uh, an ambiguity uh, as we speak. Uh, uh, another issue which came up. Uh, in this and there were two minor exceptions which were carved out. So one of the exception which was carved out in this judgment was uh, that uh, foreign lawyers are allowed to fly in and fly out but in a very casual manner while the Madras High Court had said that they can fly in and fly out on a regular basis uh, but Supreme Court said that they can fly in and fly out uh, in a very casual manner and they can, uh, during that period of when they are flying in and flying out, they can give opinion on uh, international laws and foreign laws, and certainly not on Indian laws. Now, that opens up another discussion. Uh, how will you determine uh, that this fly in and fly out is casual in nature? Uh, is there a time stipulation? So, for example, in Hong Kong, uh, they also have this kind of a concept, fly in and fly out, but they say that, uh, a foreign lawyers who come into Hong Kong and stays for a, a minimum period of 90 days uh, will not constitute a, a, a permanent kind of a uh, thing. So this this re remains a very very open issue. What constitute uh, casual and what constitute a permanent fly in fly out? Now it also. Uh, carved out an exception, uh, especially in the field of arbitration. And it said, the Supreme Court said that uh, foreign lawyers can definitely come uh, and participate in an arbitration proceeding and especially in an India seated international commercial arbitrations. So that was one good thing that happened. However, the Supreme Court said that these foreign lawyers will be, uh, will be amenable to the code of conduct as laid down for Indian lawyers, Indian advocates under the Bar Council of India rules. Uh, so these these were the restrictions. Now today, as we speak, uh, there is uh, there is a there is no system, there is no formal law or no formal system whereby these foreign law firms can come and set up their offices in India. Now that brings us to a very very important dimension as to why it is necessary and what are our apprehensions uh, in bringing these uh, lawyers, foreign lawyers, uh, and allowing them to set up their offices in India. Uh, is it really that Indian lawyers are uh, worried about? Uh, is it a case that uh, we feel that they are, they are more competent than what Indian lawyers are? Uh, is it a case that they are more knowledgeable than what Indian lawyers are? Uh, there are mixed reactions. Uh, many of the lawyers are apprehensive, but by and large, a lot of lawyers now feel that if these foreign law firms are allowed to set up their offices in India, it will help 
in getting aligned with the global practices. It will help them aligning with some of the new challenges uh, which are thrown open because of globalization of legal services. And when I talk about that, I, it is important to mention that under the uh, global, uh, under the general agreement on trade in services, GATS, which is an organ of a world trade organization, uh, India is a signatory to that. And India is committed to open up the service sectors to its neighbor nations. Legal services are included in the list of recognized services at the GATS. So India has not really opened up the legal services. And it's high time that India should look into that uh, and open up these uh, services. Now, some of the things uh, which are really uh, very, very advantageous when these foreign law firms are allowed to open up their offices in India is uh, there are a lot of complex legal issues. For example, we talk about data. So laws relating to data, we talked about GDPR, uh, the Indian uh, laws on data, which is in a very draft form and uh, likely to be enacted and, uh, and passed by the parliament. Uh, these laws are on the pattern of GDPR. So data is no more uh, an issue which is confined to a particular country. Data is an issue which is global in nature. Now, Indian lawyers will gain a lot when these foreign lawyers or foreign law firms are allowed to set up their offices in India. Uh, another issue which is uh, international in nature is cyber crime. Now, cyber crime is something which is not necessarily confined to a particular jurisdiction. There are issues relating to money laundering. There are issues relating to bribery. There are issues relating to corruption. There are issues relating to mediation and arbitration. So there are a lot of international issues and international topics which, uh, which will be hotly debated and Indian lawyers and Indian young law graduates will benefit a lot if these foreign law firms are allowed to set up their offices in India. There will be cross-border uh, transactions, complex cross-border transactions. There will be an exchange of views. There will be an exchange of ideas. And when they come into India, uh, both the Indian lawyers as well as these foreign lawyers will gain a lot uh, by way of uh, mutual interactions. Now, a lot of apprehensions uh, was raised whether these foreign lawyers will be allowed to practice in a court of uh, court, Indian courts. Now, if you see today, uh, foreign lawyers are not keen to appear before Indian courts. Whether these foreign lawyers will appear for issues like rent control, for issues like divorce, issues like bail matters. Uh, to the best of my understanding, foreign lawyers are not interested in practicing litigation in India. They will be dependent on Indian lawyers when it comes to litigation practice. However, uh, in the non-litigation matters, which is a non-court interface matters, definitely they bring in a lot of expertise. And Indian expertise, when combined with these global issues and global knowledge, uh, I think it's a mutual benefit uh, to both the sets of legal professionals. I, I think this, this session will not be complete if we don't talk about uh, the pandemic situations. Four months back, who would have imagined in India that there will be a virtual court hearing? Four months back, we were just debating about e-filings. Now see what is happening today while we have been forced into this situation. Today, virtual court hearings are happening. The boundaries have gone. People across the globe are connected with each other through Zoom calls, through video conferencing, and all the virtual hearings are happening. Lawyers, arbitrators, mediators, conciliators, they are all attending arbitration slash conciliation slash mediation proceedings through virtual hearings. So everything is going on. I mean, why is the need for a jurisdiction? Why is the need for a boundary now? Uh, COVID situation has also uh, taught us that travel jurisdictions, these are no more an important element. Uh, client meetings are happening uh, through virtual meets. 
corporate meetings are happening through virtual meets. Surprisingly, I was reading the newspaper and two important news items which surprised me is a lot of sexual harassments which are happening through virtual meetings. I just read uh, four or five days back in the newspaper that a divorce has been granted through virtual court meetings. So I think people are adopting to technology. Uh, technology is uh, going to integrate the world together. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning are changing the world. Uh, there are many technological convergence which is happening. I mean, for example, let's talk about the uh, smartphones. Now, a smartphone has uh, has replaced multiple independent devices like radio, camera, music player, torch, calculator, toy games, all are converged into one smartphone. There is a sectoral convergence which is happening. They talk about telecom, media, and inter entertainment. AT&T acquired Time Warner, which is a great example of sectoral convergence. We are also hearing from the media that Google is likely to acquire some percentage in Vodafone idea. Amazon is going to invest in Bharti Airtel. Uh, well, these are unconfirmed news, but this is what we are hearing from the media. So therefore, there is a technological convergence. There is a convergence of sectors. Uh, this is a high time that India should open up uh, to foreign lawyers and foreign law firms. Uh, when I say this, I must add a caveat that uh, before India do that, uh, there is a need to have a level playing field for the Indian lawyers and Indian advocates. For example, there are certain restrictions uh, around advertisements and solicitations, which is not there in US and UK. So Indian lawyers must be allowed to advertise and solicit uh, there is no concept of a success fee under the Indian uh, laws relating to advocates and bar council rules. There is no concept of success fee sharing. Uh, now, if India has to compete with foreign lawyers, uh, it is important that uh, the parliament should take cognizance of it and sit with bar council of India uh, and uh, have certain regulations, policies uh, devised so that foreign law firms can come, set up their offices in India. Uh, but before doing that, uh, have a level playing field for Indian lawyers. And before I conclude this session, uh, and an important uh, line item which I could see from uh, John F. Kennedy, and it says that Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word crisis. One brush stroke stands for danger. Another one stands for opportunity. In a crisis, be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. COVID-19 pandemic situation is the opportunity. Let's understand where the opportunities are, and we must encash this opportunity. India has some exceptional talent of legal professionals. Allow them to interact with global folks and have a beneficial mutual exchange of ideas. With these words, I end my session, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have later in the later part of the session. Thank you so much.